I was listening to a taped sermon by my friend Van Royen, and he began with a story that intrigued me. The evangelist had held the meetings in town, and uh, he was busy one day taking down the tent. The meetings were over. A man came along recognized that there had been some public old-fashioned revival meetings, and he went up to the evangelist in his work clothes, taking down the tent, and he said, I want to stop here and ask you what I can do to be saved. And the evangelist said, you're too late. And the man said, uh, well, I, you know, I realize I'm a little late, but uh, you're still here. You're still in town, and I don't have to go to a formal meeting. I, I'm ready for you to tell me right now what to do to be saved. And the evangelist says, I'm sorry, you're too late. And the man said, well, what do you mean I'm too late? He said it was all done 2,000 years ago. There's nothing you can do to be saved. It's already been done. And uh, then my preacher friend, as he finished the story, opened the question up to the rest of the audience and said, uh, was he right? Well, should we work on that a while now? Was he right or wrong? Before we get at each other's throats, let's um, spend a little time singing once more. I was trying to create a little space between the last solo and our own singing so that we wouldn't be running competition. So let's try it. Um, I know not why God's wondrous grace. I know not why God's wondrous grace to me he hath made known, nor why unworthy Christ in love redeemed me for his own. But I know that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. We've talked the last couple of evenings about the shaking time. And our jumping off point for this is Revelation, the third chapter. Last night we tried to get a little bit into the question of the faith relationship of knowing God. And that's what faith is all about. There's no such thing as faith without another party. Because the main idea behind faith is trusting another. Trusting another. So you have to have two parties to have faith, which immediately brings the relationship factor to the front. When we talk about faith, we're talking about a relationship. Now this evening, we'd like to move on to the next part of the counsel of the true witness, which is that we need white raiment that we might be clothed, and that the shame of our nakedness do not appear. What is the white raiment? It's the righteousness of Christ. And the righteousness of Christ comes in two parts. There are some who would question 
whether righteousness by faith comes in two parts. But I don't know of anyone who questions that the righteousness of Christ comes in two parts. Part A is the righteousness of Christ for us. And part B is the righteousness of Christ in us. Isn't that correct? It's very interesting that the inspired author who had so much to say to this church did not make the mistake of using the wrong uh, nomenclature. Listen to the way it was said years ago. At the very end, one interest will prevail, one subject will swallow up every other subject. Christ, our righteousness. Sons and Daughters of God, page 259. There it is, simply. You don't debate it. You don't discuss it. Christ's righteousness. Some of us became quite interested in uh, what this author meant by the usage of the phrase, the righteousness of Christ, or Christ's righteousness. And so... We looked up every time it was used by this author and in the context, and we discovered that 50% of the time it was used to refer to the work of God for us and 50% of the time to the work of God in us. Both. Now, this evening, I'd like to dwell on the first part, the work of God for us. And tomorrow evening, on the second part, the work of God in us. Both of them, the righteousness of Christ. If we are considering things at the very end, in preparation for Christ, then we need to understand what has been the issue all along and what will be the issue at the very end, as far as the great controversy is concerned. The issue started this way. The enemy of God claimed that the law of God was unjust, unfair, impossible, and could not be kept. And secondly, that if it was not kept and man fell, that he could not be forgiven. Those were the two charges from the very first in the great controversy. So when man fell, Satan gloated. And he said, that proves it, that God's law cannot be kept, obedience is impossible. Now he cannot be forgiven. And he had no idea that God was going to pay the penalty himself. That's the good news for this evening and for every evening and every day from now until Jesus comes that God took steps to pay the penalty himself. Well, we say that's um, old hat. That's the gospel. That's the old, old story. Yes, it is. But it should never get old, should it? And it's too bad when we've allowed it to get old. And it's too bad when we've taken it for granted. Because that is the foundation of the gospel. And if you try to build walls without any foundation, they're going to crumble It isn't safe to talk about what God wants to do in us. It isn't safe to talk about obedience or sanctification or victory or overcoming. It isn't safe for one minute without, first of all, making certain of our foundation. The work that God has already done for us. If we don't make certain of our foundation, then invariably we're going to get confused and think, that the work he does in us has something to do with causing us to be saved eternally. Or we're going to get confused and discouraged because if we don't have a clear understanding of what he's done for us at the cross, we won't have peace, and people who don't have peace can't obey.
Condemnation forces us to continue in sin. Did you know that? Lack of assurance forces us to fall. Because lack of certainty and lack of assurance causes us to worry. And when we worry, our attention is on ourselves. And when our attention is on ourselves, there's no power. The only power for living is in our attention being directed toward the source of power. That's why we have to have peace first in order to be able to obey. We have to have assurance first in order to not have an edge for the devil to step in and make hay out of whatever metaphors those are. so that he can cause us to go into discouragement. If we don't have peace, he will be able to work his cruel work every time. Every time. And he often has. Now the cross on a lonely hill, which wasn't such a lonely hill, answered the devil's charge that man could not be forgiven. 2 Corinthians 5.21 is a favorite text of many people. And I would like to simply quote it once again this evening. For God, for God hath made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we, and I'll add this part, that we who knew no righteousness might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now, the reading of the text and the misconceptions of many people can lead to the misunderstanding that God made Jesus come down and suffer and die. And this can lead to a misconception of the character of God. You know, God sits on his throne and he says, uh, I've lost my temper, son, and um, I need a pound of flesh. <clears throat> I need to see some blood. Go down there and show me some blood so that I can cool off. Uh, evidently, there have been too many people who have had that idea. Let's not forget that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Well, one day in class, a student said to me, if God loved the world so much, why didn't he come himself? Why did he send his son? And I said, there's only one way that you can ask that kind of question, and that is because you're not a father. Because if you're a father or a mother, you'll never ask that kind of question. Have you ever had a loved one, a son or a daughter that was suffering and going through all kinds of turmoil and pain and heartache? Have you ever? And you looked up toward heaven and wished that you could trade places with them? Have you ever? The one who loves and the one who looks on often suffers more than the one who is going through the pain. Isn't that true? So let's not say that um, Jesus came and suffered and his father went scot-free. That's not so. Fathers don't do that. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. At the cross, Jesus was there. His father was there too. It's very interesting. His father never left him. Jesus felt like he did, but his father never left him. He was there. Veiled in the cloud, but there. And there was no harp touched in heaven. And there were no angel songs. It was silence, dead still, as the Father and the Son suffered together. And Jesus was made to be sin for us. For us. Now, please note, this never made Jesus a sinner. Isn't that so? This never made Jesus a sinner. 
He took the penalty of the sins of the world on his own shoulders. This never made him a sinner. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him by the same token. This never makes us righteous. Any more than it made him a sinner. We are never righteous any longer than we are in Christ. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. What does that in him mean? You study that word through in its usage and you discover that whether it's talking about being in Christ or Christ being in you, it means nothing more or less than to be in relationship with him, in fellowship with him, in communion with him, in acquaintance with him. So as long as we are in communion and fellowship and relationship with him, it says we are made righteous. But this is never something that is innately ours. It never becomes innately ours because there is no such thing as righteousness apart from Jesus. No such thing. Righteousness is never an entity in itself. The Bible truth is, Romans 3, verse 10, that there is none righteous. Jews, Gentiles, whoever, there is none righteous. And that Jesus, Romans 1, is the one through whom righteousness has been revealed to this world. So the Bible teaching is that we are bankrupt of righteousness. And Jesus came to reveal God's righteousness. And as long as we are in touch with him, in connection with him, in relationship with him, we are called righteous. It even says we are made righteous in him. And it says, the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, the godly, all of it in him, in relationship with him. If that's true, then we never get righteousness by seeking righteousness. Righteousness always comes by seeking him. And that brings one of the major breakthroughs in this whole theme of the wonderful robe of Christ's righteousness. Let's stop wasting our time and effort trying to produce righteousness. That's not the way it comes. We seek Him. And as we seek Him and focus on Him and get to know Him, righteousness comes with Him. Well, someone says, is that imputed or imparted? It makes no difference. It's the same. There is no such thing as any kind apart from Him. It comes with Him. And uh, this is so complete that the book of John again and again says, If you believe in me, you will not perish. You have life. He that liveth and believeth in me shall never die. You have life now. You won't even come into judgment. You will not be judged. And it is immediate. It is present. It is certain. It is final. You know, it's good news to know about the pre-advent judgment Because the people who don't know about the pre-advent judgment have as their first judgment to face the executive judgment. You realize that, don't you? How would you like to be hailed into court? Perhaps unfairly. And the very first thing you face is the gallows. But how would you like to be hailed into court, fairly or unfairly, and the very first thing you face is a friendly high priest, he's called, who knows what it's like and has taken your place. That's the beauty of the pre-Advent judgment the Seventh-day Adventists have held to for a long time, isn't it? He's touched with the feeling of our infirmities. And those who have accepted him and believe in him, it says, are not even going to be judged. What good news that is. Well, uh, this wonderful robe of Christ's righteousness, how long will we need it? There's been some discussion in recent months about whether... uh, 
his robe of righteousness is needed at the beginning when we first become Christians, and then after that, we leave that and we go on in terms of uh, some other type of righteousness. I would like to take the position solidly tonight that we will need the robe of Christ's righteousness as our substitute, as our representative, the one who died in our place. We will need it forever. Won't we? There are three reasons why we will need what he has done for us every day and forever. Number one, because we are sinners. Romans 3, verse 10, we are sinners. Now, uh, are we sinners because we sinned, or do we sin because we're sinners? I would like to work on that one for a while. Are we sinners because we sinned, or do we sin because we are sinners? I have uh, armed myself with a little book that's called Steps to Christ. And it's always nice to be able to whip it out from your inside coat pocket and read it in someone else's words. Our hearts are evil. And we cannot change them. Page 18. Does that sound like plain English? Oh, someone says... uh, Our hearts didn't become evil until we sinned. And I said, where does it say that? Page 62. Adam. Because of his sin, our natures are fallen. Isn't that plain English? We are sinful. Unholy. Because of his sin. Then you have this comment. Education, page 29. The result of the eating of the tree of knowledge of good and evil is manifest in every man's experience. And this includes the women. We're going to have women's lib. They've got to have equal guilt too as well. There is in his nature a bent to evil, a force which unaided they cannot resist. Is that plain English? Temptations from without find an answering cord within the heart, and the feet turn imperceptibly toward evil. That's our condition. And we're told that none of the apostles or prophets ever claimed to be without sin as far as their nature was concerned. In fact, they have confessed the sinfulness of their own nature. Romans 5, verses 12 and 17 to 19 are very clear on the subject. I believe that we are sinners by nature. I do not believe that I have a sinful nature. But I believe that I am a sinner by nature. There's a difference. Sometimes we get involved in this uh, two-nature thing, you know, two and one, fighting. No, we are sinners by nature, either controlled by God or controlled by the devil. And we will always be sinners by nature, at least until Jesus comes. So because we are sinners by nature, we will need his justifying grace what he has done for us at the cross right up until Jesus comes. Right? For that reason. All right? Number two. We will continue to need this robe of his righteousness as our substitute because we have sinned. Anyone here exempt? Romans 3.23 All have sinned. Oh, someone says, that is everyone except the babies. Where does it say that? All have sinned and come short. So, um, whether you and I would ever sin again or not, 
is beside the point. We've got a bad track record. Which means that because of our bad track record, we will continue to need God's justifying grace forever. Isn't that true? Forever. And the third reason that we need his uh, robe of righteousness for us is because we do sin. Do you ever get tired of that? I don't like to sin. I don't want to sin. I don't like to fail. I don't want to fail. Do you? But we do. And I'm thankful for the news that God has the power to get me over it. And I'm thankful for the times when I have been able to see his power for that. But I still have to face this little book, Steps to Christ, in reality, where it says, to growing Christians, we shall often have to bow down and weep at the feet of Jesus because of our shortcomings and mistakes. When? Often. But we are not cast off. We are not to be discouraged. Even if we are overcome by the enemy, we are not forsaken or rejected by God. Are you glad for that? Oh, someone says, you mean we're living this close to the coming of Christ and there are some of us here still being overcome by the enemy? Where do I go from there? Because of our sins of commission, because of our sins of omission, because of things we don't even know about, because of falling short, we continue to need what Jesus has done for us, that robe of righteousness, don't we? Okay, for three reasons. And all three of them are good enough to insist that we have to have Jesus' robe of righteousness. I'm thankful for that robe tonight that was wrought out on Calvary. If it wasn't for that, there'd be no chance for any of us. And because of that, Jesus can stand still tonight with his friendly arms outstretched, and he can say, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you what? Rest. I like to try and imagine it in my mind, according to 2 Corinthians 5.21. Uh, he comes in here tonight. Imagine him walking in here tonight. And he comes down the aisle and he walks right up to you. As though you were the only one in this sanctuary. And he looks at you with his friendly blue eyes. If the German faints him. Or he looks into your face with his friendly black eyes. If the Italian faints him. Or with his Chinese eyes. I saw a picture of him the other day painted by the Chinese. And he was Chinese. Or whatever. He's the universal Christ. He walks up to you tonight and he says, I've come to trade all of my righteousness for all of your sins. And because of what he did at the cross, he can make that offer. Would you be interested? Are you interested? I have known people say, well, I, I was able to believe that. Twenty years ago when I first accepted him, but uh, there's been too much water under the bridge since then. I've passed my 490 times. And I can hardly believe that tonight. My friend, it is still good tonight. Don't you believe that? Some of us have been studying the life of Christ the last six months to try and find out all the answers we could on some of the current theological issues from the life of Jesus and his teachings. The greatest teacher the world ever had. And we came across these passages where the disciples said, Look, um, Lord, how many times shall we forgive a brother? 
um, seven. And they were being gracious because the Pharisees had a custom of forgiving three times. Three times. And so Peter, he was going to have one up on the Pharisees. I'll go all the way up to seven. And Jesus said, not seven, but seventy times seven. I asked the teachers this week up here in the early morning devotional, uh, how, how much is that? And I got 490 from some and 4,900 from some others. They're all teachers. <clears throat> but anyway, Jesus, what, what did he mean by that? He meant that there is no limit to the forgiveness. And then later he went so far as to say, if your brother trespasses against you, seven times in one day, and he asked forgiveness, you forgive him seven times in the same day. What was he telling us? But that's the way God forgives, isn't he? Isn't that what he's telling us? He's not telling us to do something God doesn't do. That's the way God does. Oh, but some people get nervous. And they say, that's too much. Don't talk that. People will take shelter under that and they'll begin to live free and loose with God's grace. No, that's not the way it works. Because the more a person is forgiven, the more he loves. Jesus said that. And the more you love, the more you obey. John fourteen fifteen. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. So if we really know God's forgiveness, we don't play loose with him. If we really know it, really believe it, it breaks our hearts and changes our lives. Isn't that true? And it brings peace so that we can focus on Jesus instead of ourselves. Well, um, how... If it's already been done, then how can I know it? Obviously, everyone in the world doesn't know it. Everyone in the world hasn't accepted it. Because there are going to be many people lost. And although we can't do anything to add to God's act at Calvary, and although we are warned that we cannot trust in ourselves and depend upon our own works, There are too many people like the Pharisees who insist on being saved in some way by which they may perform the work. When they see that there is no way of weaving self into the work, they reject the salvation provided. Although we know that we are warned against that, there is still something for the sinner to do. While the sinner cannot save himself, he still has something to do to secure salvation. Him that cometh to me, says Christ, I will in no wise cast out We must come to him. The forgiveness is never given. Without it being accepted. Or it is never mine until I accept it. Faith, back again to faith, the goal of faith and love. That's the way we accept his forgiveness. So there's nothing we can do. It's been done 2,000 years ago. That's true. But there is something we must do. We must accept it. And the way we accept it is to come to him. And Jesus said, anyone who comes is always, always accepted. John 6, 37. Well then, how do you come? How do you come to him when you can't see him? That's why I like this one, Ministry of Healing 182. Nothing is apparently more helpless, yet really more invincible, than the soul that feels its nothingness and relies on the merits of the Savior. By prayer, by the study of his word, by faith in his abiding presence, the weakest of human beings may live in contact with the living Christ, and he will hold them by a hand that will never let go. Several years ago, we traveled with Dr. Horn in the Middle East. It was supposed to be a tour for the um, pastors and evangelists, but I uh, believe to this day it was a tour for the archaeologists. 
Why? Because the day we were driving through Galilee in the bus, and we saw a village on the hillside. And I said, what village is that? And they said, that's the village of Nain. Nain? Where the widow's son was raised? Yes. We're going, aren't we? No, no. We had to hurry on to another dig to look at pot handles. And so, um, last year or so, when I was sitting with the Biblical Research Committee at Andrews University, where we sit for a week and read papers, and Dr. Horn got up with his paper, I braced my feet. More pot handles? But as he began his paper, he was obviously moved. And uh, it's something for this stoical man who went through all kinds of wars in World War II to be visibly moved. He had the latest findings on crucifixion in the days of Jesus. They have dug up some people who were crucified. And they weren't crucified like the usual pictures. In the first place, it wasn't a lonely hill. The Romans practiced crucifixion as a deterrent from crime. And uh, as such, they crucified their criminals at a crossroads where thousands of people would see. Secondly, uh, they never crucified them with any clothes on. They were crucified stark naked. Thirdly, they weren't crucified like this. The first thing they did was to put them sideways against the cross. And then they would take a huge spike and drive it in through their heels in front of their Achilles tendon with such force that the victims later torn from the cross had huge chunks of the cross still remaining in the coffin with them. And after they were securely fastened sideways through the heels, then they pulled their arms around this way and drove the nails through their wrists. And then, as if that wasn't enough, some sadists would drive a spike through their private parts. And they would hang between heaven and earth with thousands of people going and coming. And in the middle of that, on that lonely day, as far as he was concerned, you hear the words that have come down to every generation since. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Father, forgive them. And that includes you. And that includes me tonight. Are you grateful? That is the foundation of the gospel. Shall we pray? Dear Lord, we thank you that you receive sinners still. We thank you that anyone who comes is not cast out. We thank you for the friendly arms of that cross that still point us the way that we can have peace with God, no condemnation. We can accept that great trade, all of your righteousness for all of our sins. Please help us to remember and not forget.